Hello, everybody. Uh, greetings from the University of Chicago. Uh, and welcome to uh, the webinar, What is Happening in Belarus. Добро пожаловать на вебинар, что происходит в Беларуси. Продолжающиеся протестах в Беларуси. Меня зовут Ольга Соловьева из университета в Чикаго. Я буду модерировать это мероприятие. Two years ago, uh, I, uh, organ I was a co-organizer of a workshop at the University of Chicago about the culture of protests in uh, contemporary uh, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. Uh, I uh, co-organized it with my um, Ukrainian colleague from uh, Stanford, Yulia Ilchuk. And our major goal uh, of that workshop was to create a platform at the University of Chicago where the pro-democracy uh, intellectuals, artists, and uh, grassroots activists from three countries, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, could come together for a conversation outside of their um, countries on neutral grounds. Uh, at that time, of course, we had in the first line in mind the war in Ukraine, and it was our attempt to uh, counter uh, the divisive uh, tendencies of this war. And um, this event today grows out of that event two years ago. Uh, some of our participants, like Alice uh, Biatsky today and uh, Jana, were part of this workshop. And um, many um, uh, people who attend this event today participated in the workshop uh, two years ago. I just wanted to explain where the sensibility and idea of this event uh, grows. Uh, it comes from. Uh, of course, two years ago, we couldn't even imagine that something uh, like the protests which have been going today for uh, in Belarus for six months could happen there. And uh, today we want to reflect on this uh, situation. First of all, I want to un uh, acknowledge our uh, sponsors. This event was made possible by University of Chicago Departments of Slavic Languages and Literatures and Comparative Literature, Posen Family Center for Human Rights, Chicago Center for Undemocracy, and Center for East European and Russian and Eurasian Studies, and Belarusians in Chicago. Uh, I owe special thanks to uh, Esther Peters and Matthew uh, Walfen who made uh, this event possible on the level of logistics. Uh, now I would be, uh, uh, I'm very honored to introduce, to introduce our very distinguished uh, speakers uh, and participants in the round table. Um, first, it is Alice Belyatsky, uh, who is a Belarusian civic leader and founder of the Minsk-based Vesna Human Rights Center which aims to provide financial legal assistance to prisoners of conscience and their families. Uh, Alice was a prisoner of conscience himself, and uh, he won several international honors for his work, including uh, 2012 Václav uh, ha uh, Havel Human Rights Prize, and most le recently in recent protests, uh, he was honored uh, with the 2020 Right Livelihood Award uh, granted by the Swedish Foundation and by the Sakharov Prize uh, granted by the European Parliament. Uh, Alice has been underg underground all the time and very involved in the ongoing protests and uh, protection of the protesters. Alice is also an um, author of eight books and a uh, member of the Belarusian Pen Club. Uh, we are very honored to have him here because uh, he's joining us from Minsk. Uh, our uh, second honored participant is Michael McFall, who is a professor of international affairs uh, at Stanford University. He's director of the uh, he's, he's director uh, of the uh, Freeman Spoli Institute for International Studies and uh, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. 
uh, Michael McFall is very well known to our um, listeners as an international affairs analyst on NBC News and a columnist of the Washington Post. And uh, we also uh, know Michael from his service in the Obama administration, first as a special assistant to the president and senior director for Russian and Eurasian affairs at the National Security Council at the White House from 2009 to 2012, and then as a U.S. Ambassador to the Russian Federation, 2012-2014, the most dramatic time when Vladimir Putin decided to run for his third term. Again, um, uh, what fascinates me in Michael is that he has been engaged in Russia uh, for many years, not only with the government, not only with officials, but very closely engaged with the Russian people. From, uh, I was always curious what is going on the ground, and I think it's very rare. Um, our third very honored participant is David Marples, who is historian of Belarus and Ukraine. And it's very, very rare field abroad, unfortunately, to study history in Belarus in that meticulous uh, detail and understanding which Michael offers in his 16 books on uh, Belarusian and Ukrainian uh, history. And Michael also co-edited uh, four books on nuclear power and security in the former Soviet Union, contemporary Belarus and Ukraine. And I have to say that also like uh, Michael McFall, David um, has been involved personally uh, with Belarusian history for a long time as a student in the mid-1980s. Uh, in, in mid he was also participating in the Belarusian uh, liberation movement and was basically engaging with the people on the ground in Belarus. So we invited these um, participants in the first line, not because of their books, but because of their engagement on the ground and their experience in that region. Um, to um, start our conversation, I uh, wanted to offer uh, you know, my own pr perspective and what is going on because uh, two years ago after that workshop, I went to Belarus. And of course, many of us here are outsiders to the Belarusian situation right now with exception of Alice maybe. Uh, two years ago after workshop, I um, went to Minsk to meet with Alice and Alice took me on the magical mystery tour to all the places of tremendous um, intellectual activity, civic activity and cultural activity where uh, intellectuals engaged with um, preserving and rescuing Belarusian culture, which was dwindling. Yeah, the, to the places like um, uh, Vesna Center, where Alice works and which he founded, to Belarusian Pen Club, where um, a lot of translation from foreign languages into Belarusian was done by the poets and writers, by uh, to, uh, I went to the National Archive for a, con a conference in Belarusian language about a dissident writer of 1920s who was um, taking place and it was bursting with people. Uh, I went to Gallery U, uh, U I went to um, uh, Log Logvinov uh, bookstore where Belarusian books are being printed and uh, sold and translated. And I was very impressed by this tremendous energy and dedication and courage because all these activities were happening under constant threat of arrest. And I noticed that all these uh, activities were happening in unmarked apartments in Quartiras, which were always conspicuously placed in the first floor. And uh, Alice explained to me that it's because uh, the if a raid would happen, if the government would, would um, crack down, people were ready to grab their laptops and jump out the window and run, uh, run into different directions. This is not the conditions under which, under, which, uh, under which we are working here in this country yet, and maybe for a while won't, won't work uh, like this, and it was very, very impressive and admirable. At the same time, it was not clear how this activity relates to the mood in the street, because I noticed that the streets of Minsk was eerily empty. 
there were no people. And my Belarusian friends were telling me about dwindling political conscience, about lethargy, passivity, fear, despair, and um, the only hope they were saying was in rescuing this culture for this time being. But the streets of the Minsk at the same time were eerily patrolled constantly by the prisoners' transport vehicles. If you walk through Minsk for several hours, you would see dozens and dozens of these, you know, militarized machines, uh, like sharks, uh, cruising in this kind of empty pond. And uh, it, I had a strong impression that something was going on. Tremendous energy, tremendous subterranean activity on the part of the intellectuals, total silence in the street, and very strong presence of this controlling and patrolling power. And uh, it was not clear how these things are uh, connected and how they will work out. And a year has passed. Uh, by now it's a year and a half. But a year after my uh, visit in May 2020, all of a sudden this all energy erupted and we have thousands and thousands of people in the street. And uh, we have tremendous activity and we have a lot of um, intellectuals and uh, people who are not intellectuals together confronting precise, precisely those um, prisoner transport vehicles which uh, block the streets. And um, my question is to Alice, my first question is to Alice. Alice, what has happened in that year that um, galvanized people, that, uh, you know, the streets became alive. People who were just in despair and quiet and non-visible became visible and on that such scale. And uh, we know that it's, you know, these protests have something to do with elections. And we want to know um, what happened before the elections, during the elections, after the elections, and what kind of transformation in the society happened in this one uh, year, because Belarus is not recognizable uh, today. За полгода, еще полгода назад мы не сомневались, что вообще что-то будет похожее, даже не думали про это. И смотрели на эту кампанию, как на техническую кампанию, но на самом деле президентские кампании в Беларуси это единственное, наверное, политическое событие, которое привлекало и привлекает внимание людей. Но сейчас дальше как будет, посмотрим. So even a half a year ago, it was very quiet and uh, intellectual people were not expecting such an activity. But, you know, everything has changed with the presidential campaign because the presidential campaign, campaign is the only possibility in Belarus where people can express their opinions at least a little bit. То, что происходит за этих полгода мирной революции, кто-то жестким общественно-политическим кризисом. На самом деле тут все переплетено и высокое, и захватывающее, и ужасное. So, uh, somebody can say this is the half a year of peaceful revolution. Somebody can say that is a um, very dangerous political crisis. But Alias uh, thinks that everything is kind of are uh, mixed up together and uh, there are many processes that are going on. Есть несколько факторов, которые повлияли, наверное, вот на эту ситуацию и нужно говорить об плохой экономической ситуации, которая за год перед выборами ухудшилась, процентов на 50 на 15 просели доходы людей. So uh, there are, we can talk about several factors that were, uh, are influencing this uh, movement. First one is economical factor. Um, about a year ago, the uh, um, people lost their livelihood by 13% down. Lukashenko didn't propose anything new. 
В своей программе он говорил о том, что все останется так, как есть. И э, вот это вот наводило, конечно, страшный, страшный пессимизм на людей, потому как за 26 лет уже он сильно надоел людям. So Lukashenko was not uh, offering anything new in his program. He was saying that everything will stay the same. And uh, people, of course, were very pessimistic about his rule because uh, they were tired of, of his 26 years of, in power. And всплеск протестов против фальсификации выборов прошло 10 лет, и мы сейчас сами удивились, когда увидели, что новое поколение белорусов начало активно участвовать в так называемой избирательной кампании этим летом. So it's also possible to say that the society has changed a lot. So since 10 years ago, when we had very strong protests in a similar situation, um, for 10 years, uh, new people uh, were growing and this new generation uh, became very political active and very politically engaged in this new presidential campaign. Границы Беларуси оказались закупорены и сотни тысяч беларусов, которые выезжали на заработки или в Россию, или же на Запад, они все остались в стране. And uh, there is one more factor is coronavirus where uh, Belarus became enclosed and people who used to go to a neighboring country to earn money, they were enclosed in the country and it was uh, like a hot spot. Ну, компания проходила очень живо и власти сразу же начали превентивные меры. Вот за перед 9 августа уже было арестовано по нашим подсчетам 1700 человек по административным задержанием и примерно 70 человек попали в тюрьму из команд кандидатов в кандидаты блогеров политических лидеров uh, so all this energy was transferred into presidential campaign um, uh, people became very engaged and very active but uh, Belarusian authorities um, of course offered preventive measures 1700 uh, individuals were already arrested or I got administrative, um, uh, administrative measures to prevent them from participating even before May 9th. And uh, 70 people were arrested who were active, uh, political activists, bloggers, and uh, yes, political activists. <laughs> социальные сети, которые очень активно распространились буквально как пожар за эти месяцы, и миллионы белорусов начали брать информацию из независимых э, социальных сетей. And we have to add the factor of social media. Our Belarusians started enormous activity, activity where there are millions of Telegram channels, Facebook pages, where people started to get their information from them, of course, spread the information, distribute the information, and read this information and communicate there. И еще маловажно, удивительно, избирательная кампания, ведь оставили Светлану Тихановскую как технического кандидата, но она сумела объединить все оппозиционные команды, и это получился как бы кумулятивный эффект. Вот она была реальным кандидатом на этих выборах. И по нашим, по моему личному мнению, она выиграла в этих выборах. And uh, we have to consider the factor of Svetlana Tikhanovska, who uh, authority probably underestimated. Of course, they uh, jailed everyone else, uh, but her, she was left as a technical candidate. But she became a real candidate who were able to unite all uh, fractions of Belarusian society, and she. Um, definitely won those elections, as uh, Alice thinks. И вот обыденные фальсификации, которые были на предыдущих выборах президентских, и в пятнадцатом году, и в десятом, и в шестом, и в первом году, 
Все эти выборы, несомненно, были сульсифицированы. Но сейчас, наверное, впервые было ясно, что оппозиционный кандидат, который противостоял Лукашенко, выиграл, во-первых. А во-вторых, благодаря вот соцсетям люди увидели это, и это вызвало просто огромное возмущение у людей, которые раньше вообще не интересовались политикой и которые были очень далеки от политики. Um, so, uh, Alice mentions that, of course, all presidential elections in Belarus were falsified, but this year, because of very high political activity and uh, because of the social medias, it, uh, we received the evidence of the falsifications and the election, uh, of the elections, and it galvanized the people who were even far away from politics or never participated in the political process. Uh, so the evidence of the falsification, of course, brought people to the streets. Подавились протесты Лукашенко не удалось. Вот уже три месяца постоянно, каждый день происходит, то утихает, то более обостряются протесты против его и его окружения. И народ все более отдаляется от власти практически на сегодняшний день. Мы имеем ужасные репрессии со стороны властей, и власти все более превращаются в оккупационную администрацию. So um, the protests, of course, sometimes goes up and goes down a little bit, but Lukashenko, since uh, the August 9th, was not able to quiet the protests down, and uh, people are not accepting this administration anymore, and Lukashenko regime is. Uh, turning into occupational, occupational regime. Мы имеем более тысяч уголовных дел против политических активистов, которые возникли за последние шесть месяцев. Мы имеем более 20 тысяч людей, которые прошли через аресты, тысячи людей, которые были ранены, избиты, над которыми издевались. Практически в Беларуси совершилось преступление над человечеством. И Это, вот этот кризис, это невоспринятие людей, то, что предлагает режим, то, что предлагает Лукашенко, это продолжается. Uh, so since, uh, since the protests erupted, we have uh, more than a thousand of criminal cases against people. Uh, there are more than 20,000 people arrested. Um, there are more than a thousand cases of wounded or tortured people and Lukashenko cannot, uh, this is the political crisis uh, and uh, there is nothing that a Lukashenko regime can, uh, can offer anything different. He's continuing with those repressions and uh, we don't know when this, he will stop. Вот то, что сейчас было с Новой Боровой, это новый район в Минске, где проживает 15 тысяч человек, и которым просто отключили воду на несколько дней, и даже был день, когда им отключили тепло, хотя в Минске такое же, такая же погода, как в Чикаго, холодно сейчас. Uh, so what they do in Minsk, I will explain a little bit, there are um, build, a big building where people live, and other, we'll call them yards, where people can get out in their buildings and uh, talk together. So there are, um, there are yards more politically active and the uh, Lukashenko regime is trying to retaliate against them. So uh, one of the forms of retaliation was to turn off hot water and uh, the heat for several days. Uh, so just political activists had to bring water to those buildings and this is how Lukashenko regime works right now. За последние полгода быстро разрушается все то, что строил Лукашенко последние 26 лет и в идеологии, и в экономике, и в геополитических отношениях. Беларусь меняется. So for the past half year, everything that Lukashenko was building up economically, politically, and uh, geopolitically is uh, breaking down uh, with the enormous speed. Происходит созревание белорусов как народа, как нации. Происходит очень большая самоорганизация людей. Uh, we see the birth of new Belarusian nation and uh, self-organizations of the communities. 
Но э, борьба продолжается, Лукашенко не собирается уходить от власти, вокруг него сплотились вот эти военизированные э, группировки и военные группировки, ОМОН, ГУБАЗИК, отделение милиции, спецподразделение милиции, армия. Одним словом, э, ситуация не такая простая, но тем не менее за этих полгода, я считаю, мы прожили... Ну, реальный исторический этап, который другие народы проживают там за несколько лет или десятилетий. Um, regardless of this huge political activity, the Lukashenko regime is uh, not going to stop and not going to give his power away. Uh, around him uh, there are military forces, um, special forces, uh, KGB forces that are uh, fighting for their power and uh, we... Um, For this half a year, the country lived in a new political, situa uh, new political situation and maybe lost something. It's completely uh, new. Yes, uh, new life of Belarusian people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Uh, my next question is to David uh, Marples, because David has a long history of studying the Belarusian uh, protests and uh, even participating in them. I would like to ask um, your perspective on how these protests are different from what you have known and studied in the past. What, what does this culture of protest bring to this experience? What is unique? Oh, you need to, uh, we can't hear you. You need to un... Yes, okay, excuse me. Um, thank you for the question, and it's a great pleasure to, to join everyone here today. Um, I'm joining people I've admired for a long time, um, but obviously not communicated as much as I would like to have done. Um, I think they're different in a number of ways. In the past, everything was fairly well organized in terms of how elections went. In fact, the whole regime was carefully structured as a kind of social contract with the population. This was how Lukashenko phrased it. It was more or less along the lines of, I will protect you, I will feed you, I will pay you, and in turn, you will vote for me and keep me in power. Um, Belarus, I think, is a, is a state where there's only one source of power. There's only ever been one source of power since 1994, and that is the presidency. He has used referendums in order to enhance his powers, um, to muzzle the constitutional court and the parliament, and to change the way society is structured. So every single election, even though this was the time when the opposition would take part in political life, they had never any chance of winning for a number of reasons. First of all, the collection of signatures was carefully controlled so that candidates who were going to cause serious problems were not allowed to run. The collection of votes after the election controlled by the Central Election Commission, which was closely allied with the office of the presidency. Uh, Lydia Yamashina has been the chair of that commission from the very beginning, and she was the chair of the 2020 election too. I think in terms of the opposition, the difficult part was how to organize in such a short space of time without funds, without access to the media on a regular basis. And there were a number of conflicting parties usually who contested that election. In 2001, for example, there was a unified candidate who ran against the, against the president and did relatively well. Um, in 2006, there was another attempt to unify the campaign around uh, Alexander Milinkiewicz Um, who at that time was leading the Tell the Truth campaign, um, ex excuse me, for, for a free Belarus can campaign. And at the same time, another candidate came forward from the opposition, uh, Alexander Kazulin, who was the rector of the Belarusian State University. So in other words, once again, as in 1994, there were two clearly anti-government candidates or more pro-democratic candidates running against each other. And they sort of, it's a self-defeating exercise in that respect. After the 2006 campaign, there were mass protests in the October Square. There was a tent city. There was an attempt to bring about a revolution, which was called the Jeans Revolution, 
which was broken up by the authorities. In 2010 as well, um, there were two candidates that we could say represented democratic opposition in Ulezmir Neklaev and Alexander Sanikov, who only really combined their campaign on the last day of that election after the votes had been counted in the protests in the square. Once again, it ended in mass violence. I think in terms of how Lukashenko controlled this situation, the violence was selective. It was not a violent society every day of the week. It wasn't a violent society every year. But at select occasions, the violence was applied when the situation became critical. Thus, in 1999 to 2000, when there was a constitutional crisis, because Lukashenko, by the constitution of 1994, should have stepped down from office but didn't, there was a a campaign among the opposition to impeach him. And he responded to this by eliminating the next possible candidate, who was Viktor Hanchar, the vice chair of the Supreme Soviet. The chair of the Supreme Soviet had already fled to Lithuania, so he couldn't be targeted. So the vice chair was targeted. Other major figures as well who'd been part of the administration, but turned against Lukashenko, were physically eliminated. They were kidnapped off the streets and killed. But this didn't happen again every single year. So I called it selective violence. And this is how the situation was kept under control. Many major political figures who ran in the elections or were prominent in society emigrated from Belarus. We have to, they include Janem Pazniak, the first head of the Belarusian Popular Front. And also Andrei Sanikov, who was perhaps the second candidate in the 2010 elections he fled and now lives in the United Kingdom. Many younger people saw no future in Belarus and left and now live abroad. And I think all this could be sustained because of the complete control over the media and Russian support. And Alias mentioned the economy. The economy is critical, but for many years, Belarus had what was called, quote unquote, an economic miracle. The economic miracle consisted of getting cheap oil supplies from Russia refining the oil and reselling it to countries of Europe. There were arms sales as well through Russia and other countries and Belarus made money that way. So in this way, the economy could be seen as a success story until around 2008 to 2009 when the oil prices started to fall. And then again, more recently, not only through low oil prices, but through growing problems with Russia and Russia's re refusal to keep subsidizing the Belarus economy in this way. And that is the situation prior to the elections. I would just add a couple more things why, let's say things have changed. I think the social media that Alice mentioned is absolutely critical. That was never a factor in previous campaigns. It might have been in 2015 if there'd been any real participation by the opposition in that election, but there was no real official opposition candidate then. But it's played a big role because Lukashenko no longer has control however, over the information that reaches the population. Second, I noticed three years ago when the parasite laws were introduced into Belarus, which imposed economic penalties on people who were unemployed for more than six months of the year, there were mass protests all over Belarus. And this was the first time I'd seen such protests in the smallest cities. Uh, previously, they've been mainly confined to Minsk. The second thing I noted, and this is to do with my own current work as an historian in Belarus, uh, stemmed from Karapati, the, the site for political, uh, for mass executions of the Stalin era. And the regime was pressured to erect a monument in memory of the, of the victims of Stalin. So this was a, a departure from the regular policy, which is to focus on World War II and simply Nazi crimes. The regime was finally persuaded to do that in November of 2018. But the following spring, uh, vans pulled up and smashed down all the crosses at the entrance to the Kurapati memorial site, and then put a fence up around it. This offended many Belarusians, not only regular citizens, but leaders of the church as well. Uh, sorry, the, the, I would say the two churches, the Catholic church, as well as the Orthodox church, who spoke out openly against it. So for the first time, you could see the religious leaders standing up to Lukashenko, just as the unemployed workers had stood up to him before. And this was noticed. And 
lastly, the coronavirus. I don't think the impact of that can be underestimated because it forced people to self-organize who had not done so before to come up with some kind of response. Lukashenko was derelict in his duty to the people. He lost any confidence that remained among the population that he was on their side. In short, then the social contract was broken, but it was broken by the president. And I think everybody realized that at the time of the election. I won't comment much because Alice has already covered it on the campaign of the three women, but I think it galvanized society. And the fact that women play such a prominent role is not an accident in Belarus. They were the bringers of change, if you like, to the population. And the population looked on the campaign of Zikhanovskaya as something completely new, something that could bring change, even though the previous candidates for the 2020 election were either in jail or they'd fled the country. So I think these signs were there gradually, but they're a modern phenomenon. They're nothing to do really with the past. Um, the history means something because the lessons of the past have been learned, but I think it's a new era now. And I would agree with Alice on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, David. Uh, my next question is to Michael McFaul um, about, about the role of Russia in all of this, because we know that Russia and Belarus are very closely integrated and have been, since the dissolution of Soviet Union, they have been very close. And since 1997, the integration process has been progressing from the treaty on the union of Belarus and, uh, Belarus and Russia and further on. And, uh, and it's strange how little we hear about any official position of Russia on it and that it seems to me that uh, Russia is silent. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't hear much of the Russian government statement and what is going on, unlike we heard a lot about Russian statement on Ukraine, yeah? So I would like to see your perspective on this um, role. What is, to begin with, what is Belarus to Russia? Well, uh, thank you for the question and thank you for uh, having me on this panel, a very distinguished group of people. Uh, who I've followed their work for a long, long time as well, and uh, I deeply admire both your political work, Mr. Bilyatsky, and Professor Marples is without question in the English language the most important uh, scholar on Belarus, so you're lucky to have him here today. Um, and, and secondly, before I say anything about Putin, uh, I want to make clear as not an expert on Belarus, but as somebody who has followed events there for years and decades. Uh, I used to run a center at Stanford on democracy development and rule of law. And for uh, two or three years, we had Vitaly Selitsky with us, who tragically passed away. But because of his presence, we've had people from Belarus in our summer school for 15, 20 years now. Um, and it is just a, an incredible event to watch what is happening in Belarus, no matter what happens in the future. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I am deeply inspired by the, the courage and the persistency uh, and, you know, kind of undermining, let's be honest, some stereotypes that have been uh, stated about Belarusians over the years and decades, that at least in my circles, uh, that, that they don't care about democracy, they'll never rise up. All of that now is complete and utter nonsense. And I think that is a really important thing. And the notion that Alice said, that, you know, the birth of the country and the birth of identity, these are important moments in the histories of countries. And that is already, no matter what happens in the next weeks or months or years, that, those are already facts uh, in my view. And, and I just wanna say as a, somebody who values democracy and who has had the uh, experience to meet brave people who have stood up for democracy in very difficult conditions, whether from Russia or Iran or China, uh, I am just in awe of the people of Belarus right now. Uh, and I'm also, I wanna say, while I still, before I get to Putin, I'm also deeply disappointed in my own government uh, for how little uh, we have focused on this historic moment. Um, I hope that may change with the new Biden administration. In fact, I know it will change because I know those people well, uh, but we, have, we should have been doing more and at least saying the right thing. Uh, one of, my, one of my friends who, who was assassinated in Russia in 2015, uh, Boris Nemtsov, used to always say to me, he said, Mike, we don't, we don't need your help in the West. Uh, he actually said this to Barack Obama when he met President Obama in 2009. But we, 
you, we don't want you to help our enemies with your mm -hmm. silence. Yeah, uh, and I, that always has rung true with me. And I just feel like we have been too silent uh, with respect to the incredible events that are, are unfolding in Belarus today. Maybe we'll get back to that in a minute. But you asked about Putin. Um, I think there, there are two or three very important things to understand about Putin and his relationship to Belarus. When I arrived as ambassador to Moscow in 2012, uh, without question, uh, the most important foreign policy objective for the new president, because that's when Putin was reelected, was the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, didn't get a lot of attention in the United States. We wrote a hundred cables about it, you know, back to Washington that nobody read. Uh, but without question, it was the most important event, um, you know, as a response to the European Union, bring all these countries together with Moscow at its center. Belarus had joined, Kazakhstan had joined, and the drama, of course, as we now know tragically, in 2012, 13, and 14, was to try to pressure Ukraine to join as well. Uh, and in many ways, the fight over the Eurasian Economic Union versus the Euro European Union was the precipitant for Maidan. Not in many ways, it was the precipitant. So that's the first thing one needs to remember, that He's less committed to that project today than he was back in 2012. It has not gone well, but that is still the most important thing to him with respect to Belarus. Second, very important thing, um, which, which for this crowd will be obvious, but I don't know who else is listening in, so I want to make sure I say it. Uh, Putin is, I, you know, I've known the guy for a long time. I met him in 1991. We go, you know, we go way back. Uh, I used to deal with him in the government, just for those of you who don't know. Uh, I've written lots about him. We're not Facebook friends. Uh, he doesn't really like me anymore. In fact, I am on the sanctions list to, to Russia, uh, the first U.S. ambassador since Kennan to be on that list. But, but I, you know, I followed his career and I followed the way he thought. And I want to, you know, if we had more time, I think there's been an evolution in his thinking. I don't think Putin in 2020 is the same gentleman I met in 1991 with respect to his worldview. But today, uh, even more so than I would have said when I first showed up in Moscow, uh, Putin thinks that he is in an ideological struggle with the West. It's liberalism versus illiberalism. Uh, it's multilateralism versus nationalism. Um, and for a time, he was focused domestically on that fight, the first decade. Uh, and now he has internationalized it uh, to try to propagate his views around the world. And in this contest, he sees the United States of America, uh, and me personally, by the way, just so you know, he's told me directly, uh, 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 twice, uh, right to my face, uh, that, that he sees us as fomenting revolutions against uh, you know, color revolutions, against uh, uh, societies, stable regimes. Uh, of course, that goes back to Georgia, 2003, 2004 in Ukraine, um, but it became more acute for him in 2011, because remember, 2011 was the year of the Arab Spring, when lots of people were protesting in, in squares against autocratic regimes, and then at the end of that year, because of a falsified election, just like what happened in Belarus, uh, that happened in Russia as well, where hundreds of thousands of Russians came out onto the streets 2011, 2012. Remember the last time you had that many people on the streets of Moscow was 1991. Uh, we all know what happened in 1991. That was the collapse of the Soviet Union. So he uh, has become very paranoid about these kinds of movements. He thinks that, that Belarusians and Russians and Ukrainians are not capable of doing these things on their own. It has to be uh, the American deep state, right? The CIA, the, you know, the intelligence organizations, that is his worldview. Uh, and so that's the prism through which he sees events in Belarus today, for sure. And the last thing I would say, um, again, speaking to, thinking about conversations I've had with my Russian friends uh, over the years, his worst nightmare in terms of his ideology and his legitimacy for rule in Russia is uh, a Slavic country with a functioning democracy. That, that undermines all of his arguments about a strong state and traditions and culture. And that's why he was so paranoid about Maidan and 
Ukraine. And that's why he will not allow, uh, to the best of his capabilities, for that to happen in Belarus as well. But one last factor. He can't stand Lukashenko. <laughs> he, he personally thinks that guy's an idiot. I, I've heard him talk about it. I've heard his aides talk about it. Uh, partly it's because Lukashenko has played a game with him uh, over the years that he thinks has not been in Russia's interest. And, and those are all the, conf the, you put all that together, that in my view is why you see a much uh, more uh, quiet, Olga, to your point, uh, strategy vis-a-vis -vis Belarus, but make no mistake about it. Uh, you know, I think he, his, his long-term strategic vision is that this will wither, uh, winter is here, uh, demonstrations will, will fade away, and repression works. That's his, that's his calculus. And that is based, by the way, on his own historical experience within Russia. Um, uh, you know, when I arrived as ambassador, watching hundreds of thousands of people protest. And by the way, remember in Russia when that was happening, it was a much wider protest than the typical protest, not unlike what's happening in Belarus today. And that's what made it, that it was a, a coalition much broader than before made it scary. But his learning is that repression and patience has paid off. And I think he has the same strategy uh, that he's hopeful vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Belarus today. And, and I think, you know, my assessment, listening to his folks and talking to people close to him, um, they understand that military intervention would be very, very difficult and very costly. Uh, and so they're willing to have a lot of time and patience before going ultimately to that, to that end game. Uh, but the last thing I want to say, uh, I'm a political scientist by training. I've written about the breakdown of democratic regimes for most of my uh, uh, career for 30 years. Um, and I want to be very humble in saying that we as political scientists are horrible at predicting democratic breakthroughs. Uh, before revolutions, they seem impossible. Uh, after revolutions, they seem inevitable. And I want to be, I think everybody should be humble in making their assessments about what will happen in Belarus. Uh, and by the way, I served five years in the U.S. government. Let me tell you, I was there for uh, the Green Revolution in Iran, the Arab Spring in 2011, the Russian events that I just talked about, Maidan in 2013 in Ukraine, and the CIA didn't get any of those right either, uh, which is to say we're not very good at, at understanding the conditions under which there are breakthrough versus not. Um, and the last thing I'll say, um, now putting my academic hat on, is there are oftentimes near breakthroughs that then fall apart, that then create the permissive conditions for breakthroughs the next time around. Uh, this is Poland in 1981. This is Serbia in 1996. This is Ukraine in 2001. Uh, and I think it's a very important thing to, for Belarusians to remember that uh, no matter what happens in this moment, I really, just to echo what Alas has said, uh, there's no turning back. There's no, there's no um, resurrection or renewal, in my view, of the autocratic regime in Belarus. Um, as one of my friends in Moscow said, uh, well, no, no, I'm talking too long. I'll come back to my friend in Moscow later. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see a way for him to ever uh, recreate a legitimate and um, you know, stable regime. I also don't know when that regime finally collapses. And those two statements uh, sound like they're contradictions, but I think we need to hold them in our head together. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one more question for each of you before we uh, open the floor to uh, questions from our uh, audience. Uh, Alice, I wanted to ask you about the details of the protest and of the symbolism of the colors, white, red, white. These protests are happening under this uh, uh, flag of the, and the, the symbolism of the Russian flag becomes important again. It has been, you know, all the time since 1991, but it comes back. And um, you just sent me a document a legal document where, when, where a woman in some um, provincial town was arrested for holding an umbrella in white, red, and white, and the woman challenges the charges 
uh, saying that she was just uh, watching the children and chatting with other women during pandemic in the fresh air, holding the umbrella. And uh, she was charged with expressing her uh, rejection of the election results by <laughs> holding this umbrella. It is actually very impressive that this small detail, this small object in this in these colors, obviously is charged for both the government and for the people because it allows people to develop a defense. Yeah, and it's something which which allows the government to attack it, and it makes somewhat surreal impression that this whole legal process is about umbrella. And another question kind of bound out with that, we're all wondering about this uh, very uh, impressive levels of violence on the level of, on, um, on the side of the militia. And uh, I think all of us are asking ourselves, what drives those militias uh, to commit this pathological levels of violence against their own people, yeah, because these people are part of the Belarusian society, they are friends, they are families, they are affected with economic processes. Do they have some privileged status? Do they have some special um, uh, indoctrin indoctrination uh, training or what drives them to that violence in response to that umbrella in white, red, white, held by a regular woman or, you know, regular citizen in the square. Microphone. <laughs> Мы тоже как бы с удивлением и с радостью смотрим, как возвращается историческая символика. Флагу уже более ста лет, и несмотря на э, определенные запреты после референдума 95 -го года, когда э, символика была изменена, э, на э, красно-зеленый э, флаг, э, который напоминает постсоветский флаг в СССР, и также герб, который также очень похож на постсоветский герб СССР. О, казалось, что символика сейчас имеет ну, такое культур, культурное значение, и, конечно же, ее использовали при протестных акциях, но это было немного, и сами акции были небольшие. Достаточно вспомнить выборы в декабре, парламентские выборы, когда максимум которую удавалось собрать политическим лидерам, это было одна тысяча, две тысячи в Минске. И мы считали, что это много. Но сейчас произошло вот это быстрое э, возвращение национальных символов и погони, и флага. И мы ощущаем э, позитивные изменения к белорусскому языку, который также э, все эти годы э, притеснялся и выкоренялся из жизни белорусов, это является каким-то определенным элементом возвращения вот к своему «я», к воспеванию белорусов как политической нации. И, и насилие. Почему это вызывает такое а, насилие со стороны ОМОНа и а. вот этих силовиков? Куда? Could I translate? Could I translate the first part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so it will be a, a bit of a challenge to translate, but um, uh, so uh, people with people who are always active in uh, Belarusian culture and politics, they look with the joy, with the surprise, and with joy at the return of national symbol, a white, red, white flag that is about hundred years old. And um, we have to know that this flag was uh, accepted as the national symbol and in 1991. But in 1995, when Lukashenko uh, conducted his referendum, he returned the nation to more uh, Soviet form of the flag, red and green. And of course, red and green is associated with Lukashenko power. So uh, now people, uh, 
came back and they accepted this uh, white, red, white single uh, flag that signifies the birth of Belarusian nation. And uh, this became a cultural phenomena uh, with the people identification. And there is a comeback of the society to Belarusian language, which was you know, pushed away from the social sphere by um, Lukashenko regime. So now we see the coming back of the nation to their national roots and national consciousness. Я вспоминаю, в начале июля на первых митингах Тихановской, когда началась избирательная кампания в Минске, на первом митинге было несколько флагов, не больше. На там 12 тысяч человек, может, 10-12 флагов. Но уже в, после выборов, во время первой массовой вот этой демонстрации, которая прошла после выборов 16 августа, Тысячи флагов уже развивались над стотысячной демонстрацией. Это прошло просто как пожар. So, uh, we have to say, when uh, Tsikhanovskaya was uh, conducting her campaign, and she would amass about, let's say, 10, 12 thousand people, there were just several flags, maybe 10, 20. But uh, right after... Uh, the uh, August 9, with those mass protests erupted, we've seen thousands and thousands of flags. So everyone now, respectful Belarusian, will probably purchase and have a flag. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a now a marker of self-identification. Сейчас, когда э, красно-зеленый флаг э, развивается над э, автозаками, над э, тюрьмами, над э, репрессивным, над участками милиции, где избивают и мучают людей. Конечно же, для э, миллионов людей он стал просто неприемлем. И мне кажется, что вопрос э, вот этой изменения идеологемов, одной из которых является флаг, он сейчас, э, что касается флага, он решен. Uh, so, and when we see red and green flag over Lukashenko administration buildings, over the prisons, over those military vehicle that uh, come to uh, bring people to jail. Uh, this flag is rejected by Belarusian society and the Belarusian society already made uh, its own choice of red, white, red, uh, white, red, white flag. So we already made their decision. Это практически начало декоммунизации, которая идет от людей. This is the beginning of decommunization, desovitization, I would say as well, that comes from, uh, uh, it's a root crass activism. So communistic uh, power is uh, dwindling, dwindling down. О поведении и о жестком поведении э, сотрудников милиции, губазика, внутренних войск, можно говорить долго, но, конечно, если коротко сказать, это есть результат определенной психологической подготовки этих спецчастей милиции. So we, we can talk a lot about violence that is exerted by the Lukashenko regime and security forces, different kinds of security forces, but here we can say about special uh, psychological preparation of these people uh, that they go through. И это проходило годами, это не сегодня, это не новая тема для нас. This is not a new, something new that was going on for all 26 years of Lukashenko being in power. Но после 9 августа им развязали руки. Им фактически сказали, что вы можете делать все, что хотите. И в результате мы получили убийства, массовые пытки, которые продолжаются до сегодняшнего времени. And after uh, August 9, um, the authority led the security forces uh, to go to any level of violence, and as a result, we have uh, killings, we have tortures, we have wounded people, beaten up people, and there is no consequences that will be exerted by the Lukashenko regime uh, for people responsible. Но я не сказал бы, что тут э, наши эти э, подразделения, милицейские подразделения отличаются там от э, каких-то других. Скорее всего, что у каждого народа есть вот, э, похожее как бы, подразделение, и если им дают команду, освобождают инстинкты на э, возможность убивать, мучить, то это как бы срабатывает. 
And Alice wants to know that it's not just, of course, the case of uh, Belarusian uh, special forces. Uh, it probably happens in every nation when their autocratic rules tell them to exert, uh, to go to any level possible of the scare tactics and violence that happens. Yeah. Um, I would like uh, to ask another question uh, and address it to David Marples, maybe, uh, but it's also open to everyone uh, about the particular form of organization and symbolism, which seems to be uh, kind of responding and absorbing um, the whole history of the culture of protest globally. Yeah, for example, um, what impresses me that this protest is organized tremendously uh, with tremendous intelligence and tremendous coordination without coordinators. And for example, the um, slogan, be water. Yeah, this is, was the slogan, Hong Kong's protest. And my 10 year old explained to me that it comes from Bruce Lee, the technique of fighting without fighting. Yeah, be this kind of uh, evasive and fluid to, uh, response to, to respond to your opponent. We see it happening in Belarus. We see the symbolism of white color and the white ribbon was the sim uh, symbol of the Russian protest in 19, uh, you know, 2011-12 against Putin's third term. Then we have women's participation, which uh, reminds us of the mothers of uh, the Plaza de Mayo yeah, in 1970s, 80s, when the mother came out in the white kerchiefs. Uh, to protest the disappearance of their um, children by the uh, military dictatorship. Um, we see, of course, elements of Maidan. Uh, and of course, we see a lot of uh, nonviolence of Gandhi. And I can't just uh, uh, suppress an impression uh, that somebody really was very closely paying attention to everything which worked and didn't work you know, around the world in those protests. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of spontaneity, but it seems that there's a lot of kind of political awareness and intelligence which, which goes into this organization. Yeah, I saw recently an interview, maybe yesterday, by somebody who was beaten up and tortured by police, and they were asking him, not police, militia, yeah, uh, asking him, who are the organizers? Who are the organizers? And he said, there are no organizers. I don't know who are the organizers. And uh, he was truthful, yeah, because it seems to be kind of spontaneous action, but also extremely well coordinated, strangely coordinated, how these women in white dresses come out with the roses. And uh, beating up these women, of course, compromises the regime tremendously. Yeah, it's much more severe act of violence than, uh, you know, fighting with men. So uh, I'm curious, David, do you have, uh, any observations about this organization of protest, which is going on now? Uh, and uh, as a response, or maybe Michael has also something observed, has something observed about it, as a response to the experience of the last several decades of protests. Yeah, I think you have to approach that question on a number of different levels. Um, first of all, as you said, there's no real leaders, leadership. I mean, there is Sikhanovska, but she's outside the country. And the coordinating council that she decided to establish um, has been more or less targeted because that was the only visible organization to the regime. And everyone who was a member of that council and remained inside Belarus was arrested. Uh, fairly promptly because that was then the focus but it didn't really stop anything because that was not the catalyst for the protest it was not the the where the energy came from i think um the the term self-help organizations has already been mentioned uh, once by by alice this has been a feature i think of the whole election campaign and the subsequent events so that people are organizing themselves they're taking it upon themselves to take actions that formerly they would never have even been willing or, or capable of doing. Now it's happening and it's happening at the regional level as well as the central level in Minsk. You do have some coordination of precision through elements like telegram 
agency which can operate outside the country but it can be used for forms of communication by by mobile phones uh, within the country um, you have particular figures i think who who maybe stand out and are doing some organization but they're not necessarily known to the regime to do this you've got to have a lot of unity and there's been a clearly a decision that this has to be peaceful i mean you mentioned gandhi which is a good example of course but it's a long time ago when when that organization moved against british control in in india in in today the situation is very different and the circumstances are quite different but this peaceful demonstration is what stands out in belarus compared to say some of the violence that took place in ukraine during the latter parts of the maidan when you could clearly see that you know some groups more extreme groups come into the protests and kind of taken them over in a, in a certain direction which was to get rid of the president in that case but here i think it's more of a peaceful progress process in contrast to the violence that's exhibited by the regime and it stands out all over the world this is what people see and it sort of demarcates the two sides into very black and white you know one is completely black and the other is completely white and that is the genius of it i think if any if the people ever resort to violence then i think this whole uprising would not succeed but it's because of the the peaceful nature of it it will take longer of course because people don't voluntarily resign from their positions but they are getting weaker and weaker the longer it goes on the weaker the regime and the less the chances of any kind of response from lukashenko or from his supporters in in moscow or wherever and that is how i see it changing but of course if Lukashenko leaves and I think that has to be the first priority before any kind of um, settlement is reached Lukashenko has to leave the scene and the demonstrators realize that that's always the first thing they say when you ask them what they're fighting for the second is the release of political prisoners and then after that most likely would be new elections on a democratic basis but unless he leaves um, I don't think this would change and they know that and some people have asked the questions, right? Um, should he be brought to the negotiating table and what should he have to do? Uh, the answer is no, he should never be part of this. He's done. And he's simply an occupational force, as Alice said. And that's mm -hmm. what I think has to happen. He has to go first and then there will be changes. So, thank you. Michael, do you have a response to it or? Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick comments, but maybe also a question to the other panelists. Yeah. Um, uh, two things I would say. One is uh, to your point about understanding new technologies and modalities for protest, uh, leaderless protest, how um, uh, forces in, Be in Belarus are connecting to the outside world for all kinds of different platforms. I personally do that episodically that all needs to be studied and it's new and you know there was a wave that uh, 10 or 15 years ago that there was a whole movement called liberation technology that these new platforms were going to be good for democracy uh, now there's been a counter wave thinking particularly about china that new technologies are helping the autocrats and i would just say i think that debate is still open and it needs to be studied uh, more uh, closely and, and what I see in Belarus, including like texting, right? Like there, there are things you don't see that uh, people are using um, in very, very creative ways. In addition to the channels that were talked about, yes, now what they're doing, very, very creative new things that are happening. That's, and we need to study that and understand it better. The second comment I would make comparatively, um, you know, as somebody who's studied other transitions and breakdowns, uh, it is often the case, it's not a necessary condition, but it's, it's often present um, that there is splits within the Ancien Regime, splits within the old order, both uh, at the top between elites and, as I wrote in an article about color revolutions 15 years ago, uh, the, the people with the guns. Um, and, and I would be interested you know, if you think about a lot of transitions, right, and, and a lot of transition leaders that we've been talking about, uh, who was the leader of the transition in Serbia in 2000? That, those were people that were, you know, that were used to be in government. Same in Georgia, same in Ukraine. Um, 
Uh, I think of Egypt uh, in 2011, that was a split in the Anshan regime. They pushed out Mubarak, uh, but the military stayed, the SCAF stayed, General Tentawi. Um, and sometimes that leads to bad outcomes. Egypt is a good case uh, that shows that it leads to bad outcomes. Uh, but, but even going back to the Soviet Union, you know, Boris Yeltsin was not uh, from the streets. He was from the Politburo. Um, and when there was a split, then the, at the top, they then went to the people with the, guy, the, people with the guns, literally, you know, in August 1991, uh, giving those uh, tank commanders uh, dual instructions. Um, and I'm, I'm curious uh, for those, for, for both my colleagues, is there any evidence of splits within the ruling elite in Belarus, uh, number one, and uh, between the Siliviki, between, you know, uh, with those that actually control coercion, uh, because those to me would be uh, important indicators of uh, the longevity of the regime. Um, I think Al we should go in order. I think Alex should go first. David, oh, Alice, okay, Alice. Что касается элит, нужно говорить только о дипломатах. На самом деле, несколько послов подались в демиссию. Другие же, если посмотреть на, скажем так, хозяйственные или же вот среднего звена, элиты среднего звена, я не сказал бы, что тут видно какое-то расслоение, хотя процессы, конечно, пошли. Нужно понимать, что еще полгода назад они смотрели на Лукашенко как на Бога. У никого вообще никаких сомнений не было, что ситуация может поменяться, может нужно делать какой-то выбор там политический, про это вообще никто не думал. И сейчас эти процессы, я уверен, идут, но они не явны, потому как если находятся те люди или чиновники, которые открыто заявляют об уходе со службы, часто мы видим репрессии, особенно в отношении там, силовиков. Вот. Часть из них вынуждена была бежать из Беларуси. Вот. Поэтому явного раскола нет, но посмотрим, как дальше будет развиваться ситуация. Видим, видно, что процессы пошли. Вот. И э, второй вопрос был. Нет, это был самый главный вопрос. Это окей. Могу я переводить, пожалуйста? Если мы говорим о элитах, Uh, we can say we, we've seen the evidence of some diplomatic corpus um, split from the administration, but if we talk about uh, el other elites or more economical elites, we, could don we do not see this evidence split yet, but we have to know that even half a year ago, all the elites were looking at Lukashenko as at the god. So there is some crumbling of the system down. Uh, we see some people coming out of the system, but they are persecuted and they have to leave the country. So something is going on, there is a process, but it's not very evident. Но с другой стороны, их активно тасуют зараз, как колоду карт. Вот. Одни их меняют, вторых отсылают куда-то. И последние изменения в силовом блоке тоже говорят о том, что нет доверия у него даже к проверенным вроде бы кадрам. Поэтому тут бывший премьер-министр, кстати, тоже у него попал в число неблагонадежных. Вот. Поэтому ясно, что тут не все так просто, и сам по себе корпус абсолютно преданных ему людей, он очень узок. And it says, uh, you know, some indication of uh, that situation is not so simple. Uh, so even prime minister had to go. And uh, but we we know that the people whom he uh, in whom them he has confidence is very narrow. Mm -hmm. I, th I think um, my response would be similar, but I it, it's a great question, Michael. I think. We saw right at the beginning of this election campaign um, two candidates who you could say were from the from the establishment. Um, one was Babarika, Victor Babarika, the former head of the um, Gazprom Bank in Belarus, and the other was Victor Sapkala, who was 
one of the founders of the High Tech Park and former ambassador to the United States. And I think this came as, an, as a surprise to Lukashenko. And you also had, you know, one of the supreme bloggers on YouTube, I should say blogger actually, in, in Tikhanovsky. I mean, these were all perceived as a threat by Lukashenko. And he would not allow any of them to run against him. And I think Babarika, you know, began by collecting about 500,000 signatures, which is five times more than it was officially needed. So I think from that point, it was clear that there was a split in the elite. But I would say that there hasn't been a complete split. Um, there hasn't been a complete split because members of the elite have also stayed loyal. The Siloviki were brought in and the Siloviki who were there before have remained loyal. And the biggest surprise to me and the biggest disappointment, I would say, was the, was the attitude of the foreign minister, uh, Mr. Mackay, who one might have thought uh, he was the one involved in the dialogue with the Europeans, the dialogue with the West, the sort of modernization of Belarus, reform movement, pro-democracy. He has been stalwart in his defense of Lukashenko and he stood right behind the regime, which suggests to me there is some way to go before you can really talk about a split in, in the elite in Belarus. Uh, what do you make of the fact that uh, Lukashenko in October met with the uh, imprisoned opposition in the prison for this four and a half hour conversation, which we don't know what it was about, but it was a striking uh, move. And again, it was some, somewhat surreal to come and talk to people, you know, uh, who are imprisoned by you. <laughs> Um, if you're asking me, my opinion would be it's, it's a sign of weakness. It's a sign that he's in real trouble and that he wanted to make some kind of deal. And it obviously failed. It clearly failed with Babarika and it failed, um, obviously, to, to most people who observe that. You, I mean, it's incredible that you would get this, right? A president who actually goes to prison and talks to prisoners. Um, this suggests to me that, first of all, it's a desperate move, but second, he recognizes Babarika as someone from his own group, you know, from one of his members of the elite who we normally could get along with and has somehow lost faith in him. And clearly Babarika is, is um, going to continue in his opposition from a statement he made today. I mean, it's quite obvious that um, he's not going to compromise with Lukashenko on it under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe this also offers an answer to Michael's question. Uh, about Lukashenko. We are um, approaching the end of our event and we received a lot of questions, but all of them, most of them were already uh, answered uh, in your conversation, but one of them uh, came from several people of the same question, how the international community can help and uh, what can be done uh, by different countries in Europe, also in the United States, and in response to this question, I actually would like to offer the floor to our dear translator, Jana Chernyavskaya, whom I didn't introduce earlier in order to introduce her right now. Uh, Jana is the leader of the community of Belarusians in Chicago. And she is a teacher in our of chemistry in Aurora, Illinois. And she is very active in the process, um, in, in uh, activities which support the liberalization, uh, the democratization movement in uh, Belarus, you know, um, she uh, works close actually with the Illinois government on um, producing legislation which uh, would be helpful to Belarusian prisoners of conscience and to Belarusian students. And I would like to give floor to Jana and thank you for her translation. Uh, she kindly agreed to do it because she, she's not a, pros, uh, 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 a professional translator. It was very kind of you to do it. And Jana, could you please uh, tell us about uh, what can be done for the Belarusians or Belarusians, as Belarusians want to be called, and maybe give us a link if we can uh, sign something and uh, do something. All right. So. Um... Olga, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I would say not only me and not only Belarusians in Chicago, all Belarusians uh, all over the United States are trying to work with uh, United States legislation on Belarusian 
Democracy, Human Rights and um, Sovereignty Act. This act was introduced by uh, the member of uh, Representative Smith in House of Representatives and actually this law already passed the House of Representatives this week on November 18th. Now next step is the Senate. Uh, if the Senate will pass this, uh, this law um, during the session. And uh, it's, it's look at endeavor. It's a very difficult process because there are many laws and I was talking to Senator to uh, several um, aides uh, in, the Senate, in the Senate in Foreign Relations Committee that it's quite difficult to do so in this session. So now several options are considered. Uh, what is this law about? Uh, this law uh, will definitely put sanctions on Lukashenko regime. And I think we all Belarusian Americans believe that um, the United States and the European Union should introduce more sanctions for the regime for their unprecedented level of violence. And uh, this law will demand uh, the freedom for political prisoners or for any prisoners. And this law will uh, um, support a democratic movement and Belarus democratic aspirations of Belarusian people. And uh, yes, again, sanctions on the regime on uh, um, everyone responsible for fraudulent elections and everyone resp responsible for the atrocities in the cities and towns for Bel in Belarus. How fast this law will go, we are working on it. Uh, unfortunately, I will not offer a petition right now because a, a new petition is uh, created uh, this weekend by several people and it will be available on Facebook and Belarusian medias and it will be available on our Belarusians in Chicago website. It's very easy to um, remember. It's called Belarus chicago.org i will uh, put um, the address in uh, the chat belarus chicago.org also i'm sorry i have to i'll have to change that also i will say that on this website it's possible to uh, find the links to donate to make monetary donations to the repressed people of Belarus, there are many of very legitimate organizations that are mostly in Europe that are collecting donations for these repressed people, for people who lost their job uh, in, uh, as a result of the persecution. So I encourage people to go to the website belarusschicago.org and uh, make donations and we'll have petitions available very soon to contact your senators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jana. And uh, we have the last question to round this all up. Uh, Michael, you asked this question about uh, these two principles, two factors, which uh, in your uh, writings you defined as a factors for successful uh, color revolution, and it's actually being quoted now a lot in um, relation to Belarusian protest. And I just wanted to ask all participants to say briefly your opinion, whether you consider the events in Belarus, this protest as it's going on, a successful protest. Michael, is it in your eyes a successful protest or you are ready to redefine your principles through this, um, or your factors through this example? Uh, did I unmute myself? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Well, uh, first of all, the piece that you're referring to is a Journal of Democracy piece from 2005 called Transitions from Post-Communism. There are seven factors there. And by the way, I talk about what was missing in Belarus and Russia at the time, why the conditions were not right. Uh, I want to be clear, I was writing that as a professor uh, some people, including here in the United States now, uh, cite that as an article for how I am leading a color revolution against uh, President Trump. And that is not my, <laughs> that was not my intention in writing that many years ago. It was a, it was a piece, uh, uh, an academic piece. Um, and I, I would just say, you know, again, uh, as somebody who studies comparatively uh, democratic transitions, that uh, some split in the ancient regime amongst elites and amongst those with guns 
uh, is usually a condition of, of a successful change. And um, we've had a nice discussion about uh, where those conditions are at. I, I would just say from my perspective, uh, you know, don't prejudge uh, where we're at in history here. Uh, I think it's way too premature. There are already people saying Lukashenko is going to persevere and Putin's won. Uh, I think that's not right. I think there's a lot of history to happen. Um, uh, number two, I do think uh, one of the conditions that will change will be the United States government. Uh, a Biden administration will have a very different approach, generally speaking, to democracy and human rights around the world. Uh, I, I worked with the vice president, uh, traveled with him to places like Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Russia. Um, he will uh, bring attention again to these issues. And it's great, you know, I, I'm participating in uh, lobbying with the, the new act on Belarus that, that Jana mentioned, uh, but, but President Biden doesn't have to wait for that act to pass. He can put sanctions in place January 21. Uh, and I urge anybody that cares to, to keep talking about, there's no reason to wait. There's all kinds of things, the Magnitsky Act, but he doesn't even need that Magnitsky. They could literally do it overnight. And I hope that that will happen because that will shift I, the debate. And I hope it will shift the debate in Europe, quite frankly, too. I've, I've, been, I've been disappointed in our European colleagues. This is not happening in a faraway place. This is happening in Europe, these demonstrations. These are Europeans. It's on the border of the European Union. Um, and I go to lots of meetings in Europe and I hear about how uh, Europe needs to take a greater leadership role in the world and we can't wait for the Americans anymore. Well, do it, <laughs> you know, uh, lead. Um, and, and I just would encourage everybody listening to, to, that has the chance to help keep that pressure alive so that this doesn't, you know, the issue doesn't fade away. Tragically, in my country, there's been so much drama happening here in the United States that people don't have the bandwidth uh, to focus on this, even in the news, by the way, as somebody who participates in the news, uh, it's disappointing to me how little news we've had in Belarus. But it's not over yet. I think things will change with the Biden administration. And I just think we need to keep uh, uh, attention on what is happening on the ground in Belarus because of the heroic, you know, the heroic acts that people like Alash and his colleagues are doing. And this event is one of them. And so I congratulate you, Olga, for uh, organizing it. So thank you very much. Alice, do you want to say some last words about your assessment of the uh, impact of what is going on, whether it's successful or not? Or should we change the notion of success to begin with? Безусловно, мы не, еще раз повторю, мы не ожидали того, что произошло во время и после этой избирательной кампании, и для нас это э, вдохновляюще, фактически то, чем занимался правозащитный центр «Весна» все 24,5 года, сколько мы существуем, вот эти лозунги сейчас они на устах э, миллионов белорусов. Проведение свободных выборов, освобождение политических заключенных и покарание преступников, которые совершали эти преступления. Об этом говорят все. Um, there is no doubt it is a success story because we, we haven't expected this activity and whatever we were doing in, uh, for 10 years in Human Rights Center is now our, our ideas now are on the, um, on the minds of every person. It's a free election, freedom for all political prisoners. So all society lives with those democratic aspirations. It is a success story. Но еще процесс не окончен, он продолжается, и нас ждут еще трудные и тяжелые времена, которые будут связаны и с потерями, и со смертями и с убийствами, и с другими нарушениями прав человека. И, конечно же, я целиком поддерживаю что, то, что международное сообщество должно быть более активно, как Европейский Союз, так и США, по отношению к тому, что творит сейчас белорусский режим.
so, but the democratic process, uh, so this uh, uh, democratic move movement is not over and we will go through difficult times. Uh, we'll have uh, people wounded, we'll have people hurt, we'll have people killed because Lukashenko regime is fighting back and we do need the support of international community to help us to go successfully uh, to the democratic changes and to establishing our democratic society. So thank you very much. And the last word is to David Morpholz, the same question. Uh, one minute. <laughs> yeah, it's premature, of course, to try and judge it now, but it's achieved, it's achieved a remarkable lot in a very short time. There's no way to go back. And if you can think five years ahead, you know, you can guarantee Lukashenko will not be running for president in 2025. And you could not have said that about any previous election as a guarantor for the future. Having said that, I'm not sure how it's going to end or in which case it's going to end and who's going to play a role. But I think we should support the aspirations of Belarusians for a more democratic and freer society and with an end to the brutality and violence of this regime, which has been in power for far too long. And I don't normally advocate. I simply don't. Um, but that is, is my comment on, this, on these events, that it's a tragedy in some ways what's happened so far, but it's also inspirational. And they've achieved changes that could not have been imagined before. It's a youth movement. It's young. It will last. It will certainly last longer than this president and the miserable creatures around him. No, I will stop there. Thank you so much. Now we have to finish. And I think every single one of our participants and of people who attended this event. Uh, so and thank you for your support of uh, Belarus in these difficult times. And thank you for giving us your time and sharing your expertise, which I think bringing us a step forward, a little step, but forward. Thank you very much. And I say goodbye at that. Thank you very much too. Bye-bye.